Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. How's Toronto? It's good. Yeah. How's the virus over there? You guys doing okay? Yeah, uh, we've started to reopen a lot of things. Okay. Um, so we're in phase two of that now. What's school going to be like? Have they determined what you guys are going to be doing? Um, it'll be online for the first semester. Okay. And then second semester should be back to normal for now. Cool. Dad willing. All right. Patrick, Michael, should we begin? Yes, please, George. Thank you for joining us. Girl, let's go ahead. We're, uh, we're excited to have you and ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Krolos, um, uh, Athanasius' son. I'm delighted to uh, uh, present to you one of uh, my close friends from Tina and my time down in Dallas when uh, George and I were living down there way back in 2013. You can imagine it's been that long. Uh, I met George when I was uh, tasked to help out with the servants prep program at St. Philippeteer Church in a suburb of Dallas uh, by a... Uh, Otsabuna Philemon. And so when I was there, I noted this one student who was never paying attention in class <laughs> because he was always doodling on his paperwork. And we do all these different things and all he would be doing is just drawing and not looking up. And then I finally decided, let me look at what he's doing. And lo and behold, he's doing all of this all over his papers, right? So I'm like, huh. Let's uh, maybe encourage this instead of try to stop this. And lo and behold, he is now in art school in Toronto, making these amazing, beautiful pieces of theology uh, that are absolutely beautiful. Uh, these are just a few of examples of the work that he did that I have, uh, that we have in our home. Uh, and he's won various awards and he's done so many other commissions, both private and uh, in churches. Uh, and I hope that you guys will be able to uh, learn as much as I did from being around him, both physically and virtually, for the last almost decade. Um, with this short talk, uh, no further ado, George McCary. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I Should I share my screen if I have a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hi guys, good morning. Um, thank you for letting me give this talk. Um, this topic is a very dense, heavy topic, um, and so it, it's difficult to condense it into, into one talk or one PowerPoint. Um, but I will try my best to briefly overview the condensed history one, um, and technique and style and theology of the icon. Um, and at the end, if there's any questions, I can, I can try to take those as well. Um, and so the icon, the first time we hear the word icon um, in, in the Bible, is in the very first chapter of Genesis. Um, and the very first recorded act in the Bible of God is the act of creation. And so there's this very large importance um, to the act of creation and being creator um, it, within the church. And, and it is seen as something that is sort of um, a calling um, to, to produce um, created work even in the Old Testament um, in the time of Moses um, and in Exodus God appoints um, people to create for the tabernacle um, and to create works of art and to create them in very specific ways to accomplish very specific functions and so creativity um, has a very big role in the church but it is a very it is a role that is very strategically played um, and God, one of one of the, the biggest um, 
moving points for how the icon is created is how God creates men. Um, you know, and so you have God who says, let us make men in our image. Um, and the word for image in Greek is ikon, and according to our likeness. So God created a man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Um, and so we are God's icon, and we are called to be icons, and we are called to create icons. Um, and so it is this, God shares with us the ability to do what he did, um, and God gives us the opportunity to be iconographers as he is the first um, iconographer. And St. Athanasius speaks a lot about this in um, his work on the Incarnation. Um, and he speaks a lot about how the Incarnation itself um, is also important to the idea of um, the image of God and bearing the image of God and us being able to bear that image. Um, and he says, in particular, since such error is the cause of their destruction and disappearance, it was not right that those who had once partaken of the image of God should be destroyed. What then was God to do? Or what should be done except to renew again the in the image so that through it, human beings would be able once again to know him? Um, and so again, he's talking about how, you know, this idea of the image is, is one of those... Um, bridges between God and men. It's something that is used as a tool to unite God and man. So in the beginning, God unites with man by creating man in his image, and God unites with man by becoming incarnate and taking on the image of man so that we can become like God. And you see in the Gospel of John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. And so we see God through the image of his son. And we create the image of his son, and we see the image of his son in his saints and in ourselves. And so thus the icon becomes um, not only a window, but also a mirror a mirror in which we see the image of God in ourselves and which we strive to always perfect that image of God within ourselves so that we see ourselves in the icons before us. Um, again, in the Gospel of John, you see, um, say, you see God saying, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Um, and St. John of Damascus, who was a pivotal figure in the history of iconography, um, also says, like in former times, God, who is without form or body, could never be depicted. But now, when God is seen in the flesh conversing with men, I make an image of the God whom I see. I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter, who became matter for my sake. Therefore, I boldly draw an image of the invisible God, not as invisible, but as having become visible for our sakes by partaking of flesh and blood. Um, now, St. John of Damascus is an important figure because... There was a point um, in our history where we experienced something called iconoclasm and icons were seen as, as idols and they were seen as something that was being worshipped. And he was the figure that clarified that we do not worship um, what is created, but again, the creator of that matter. Um, and so he is the reason why we have icons in the church today. Um, and the restoration of the use of iconography in the church is known in the Eastern church as the triumph of orthodoxy. So that just goes to show the significance of icons um, in our church. Um, when it comes to tradition, so, so iconography is a, a thing that is seen universally within the Orthodox church. And holistically speaking, it's a tool that, a that is used by all the branches of the Orthodox Church. However, each branch of Orthodoxy um, has dealt with it in a different way and has had a different history with it. Um, and so each, each icon accomplishes the same goal, but does so in a different language. Um, and so we'll, we'll look more closely at the Coptic language of iconography. Um, Although many of the principles 
um, that come into that are are very universal, and you'll see them in the other Orthodox churches. And so here on the screen, you have um, a very famous icon from the Louvre of Christ and Abbot Mina, and it was painted in the 8th century on a wooden panel, and it shows... Um, Christ embracing Abbot Mina. This isn't the same as Saint Mina. This is the abbot of the monastery at the time. Um, and Christ is embracing him as a friend. And so sometimes you'll see this icon referred to as Christ, the true friend. Um, and it just goes to show how Christ is represented in these icons as, you know, a companion. Um, and and, and in, in, in this icon was created as, as in memory of, Abbot Mina. And so Abbot Mina had died and this icon was created of him in a way that was similar to the Fayum portraits, which we'll look into in a little bit. Um, but this wasn't meant specifically for any liturgical use, but it was meant to show the relationship between Abbot Mina now that he's died with Christ um, in the form of an icon so that the viewer or the monk can meditate on that relationship. Um, and so you'll see in, in the monasteries that, you know, icons and iconography are very personal in use. So this apse from the 8th century from the same monastery was actually um, in a monk's cell. It wasn't in the apse of a church. Um, and so the monk would stand right in front of the Virgin, who is much smaller um, than she seems in this picture. And he would stand in communion with... Um, all these saints that are surrounding him. And so within the Coptic tradition, you have these, these paintings that are being used um, in early monasteries as very personal and very intimate um, objects of prayer um, and use and, and, and uh, instruments of prayer. And it's only until churches start becoming a lot more cosmopolitan that iconography spreads as something that is a lot more um, communal in the way that it's used. Um, the human brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text, and 90% of information transmitted to the brain is visual. Um, and so that just, it's a little fact that goes to show why the use of imagery is so important in the church, and why it was such an effective method of evangelism in the early centuries um, of Christianity spreading. Um, and you, again, when I was talking about how each branch of orthodoxy treats um, iconography in a different language, but uses them for the same purpose, you have an Ethiopian icon, a Coptic icon, and a Russian icon. Um, all three depict the same thing. All three view the same subject matter um, in the same way theologically. However, each one has a language or vocabulary that is used to create this sort of intimacy between the viewer and what is being viewed. And so there's this sort of idea of recognizability or um, being able to develop a meaningful relationship with, with, with what is being painted um, in order for us to better understand, because ultimately the icon is a tool for us to understand the theology and the liturgy and the dogma of the church and the history of the church. Um, but the iconographer uses a particular language that will best be suited for who their audience will be. Um, and so that's one thing. The language is one thing. And the language continues um, in the symbolism and theolo theological language of the icons. And so I'll very quickly go through um, some elements that you'll see in the icon. Although I do want to mention that everything in the icon has a theological or historical significance. Nothing in an icon should be painted haphazardly. Um, and that's why a big role of what the iconographer should be doing when approaching icons is researching um, and basically drenching themselves in the liturgy and the life of the church to fully understand what they're painting. Because there's nothing in an icon that is painted out of decorative um, purpose. Everything has a meaning. Everything um, is something that can be discovered. Um, and, and the icon is a liturgical book for the congregant to use in understanding the life of the church because the icon is just like the symbols and triangle, a liturgical instrument that is used in the church to understand it. Um, and so one of the elements of iconography that is very important is calmness. You'll see that a lot of figures 
um, stand calmly and they face forward and they invite the viewer to prayer. Um, and that is a very important thing in the icon because if the icon is, I'm sorry, full of movement and, and excessive vibrancy and too many colors and, and it is treated as a work of art, it's difficult for the viewer to be invited um, to prayer. And so one of the main points of the icon as a whole is that it should be conducive for prayer. You'll also find that the hand gestures um, are an important indication of what's going on within the icon. Each person is doing something very specific and each hand gesture is not just a, a filler of space. It's, 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 a, it's a part of the communication of what's going on in the icon. And so um, you'll have, for example, John the Baptist here standing behind Christ with his hand open. His hand is open because he presents Christ to us. You'll also have Christ with both of his arms open, hands open like this. Um, and this is used to reinforce the idea of kenosis. Um, kenosis is a Greek word for self-emptying. Um, and so Christ is emptying himself by delving into the waters of the Jordan for us to show us um, this concept of rebirth, of baptism. And so his hands are open because he is obedient. Um, and so John the Baptist is showing us the obedience of Christ and Christ presents himself to us and Christ is presented to us as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist in order for us to understand this idea of self-emptying and of humility and of Christ emptying himself for us and descending into the waters of the Jordan for us. And so all of this you can get from just the hand gestures and that's why it's important for things of this of uh, th things that seem this small to us to be treated carefully, you know, and you have all of these angels who are surrounding Christ who are attending to him. Um, and you'll see that the angel here on the left holds um, a towel, but the way that he holds it is also in a way where the angel will receive Christ. And so the angel mirrors in the way that he's holding this towel, us holding the lefefe in receiving communion. And so just as we receive communion by opening the lefefe open to receive the body of Christ, so also the angel stands by the river Jordan with a towel as though he will receive the body of Christ himself, as if he will attend to Christ and the body of Christ, because ultimately the baptism is an image of the burial of Christ. Christ is getting buried in the water in the same way that the, the baby is Sub, submersed into the water three times, you know, and so all of these things come together in one icon to tie together everything that we know, you know, so you have kenosis and you have the burial of Christ and you have the Eucharist and you have um, Christ as the Lamb of God and you have all of these things being tied together into one icon and one way of just interpreting that is the hand gestures, is trying to understand what are the people in the icon trying to tell me with their hand gesture? What is the icon trying to convey to me silently, as St. John of Damascus says? Evil is depicted, um, as you can see in the icon on the left, as something that is very small and insignificant and relatively powerless to us. Um, and this comes from the ancient Egyptian tradition of painting um, enemies of war. They are painted under the feet of those who are conquering them, and they are painted as these small, weak, insignificant people. And again, that goes back to the idea of how tradition uses a particular language. Well, within the Coptic Church, what you will see a lot is using the language of the ancient Egyptians and the pharaohs to convey ideas of Christianity. And the reason that is, is because in the early church in the early Coptic church, a lot of this pharaonic um, imagery was used to convey things to the new faith and to the new faithful um, in a language that they already understand from previous um, styles of art that they were already familiar with. And so you'll have evil depicted as this tiny insignificant person, whereas in European or Catholic or Western art you'll have evil depicted as something that is life size, the same size as, you know, it, it's depicted in, in a way that is not um, particular or, or strategic in any way. It's just, it's just there, you know, but the church presents to us as a symbol, um, a change in size of how evil is presented. Um, 
again, going back on the thing of who's small and who's big in an icon, um, the focus on the main subject is mainly cast on to the main character through size. And so you have Christ calming the storm here, um, and you have Peter in the ship. And they are two completely different sizes. Um, and that comes again from Pharaonic tradition of hierarchy and art. Who is more important? I will take the person that is more important and I will expand them. I will make them the larger character and everything else in the story is less significant and much smaller. You know, and you even have in this icon, everything revolves around Christ. The water revolves around Christ. The boat revolves around Christ, even the sky. Everything comes down under the obedience and command of Christ. Christ controls everything in this icon, and he is the figure that we ask to calm the storms in our lives. We stand in front of this icon and we ask Christ, my life is a storm right now. My life is like this sea and I feel as though I am drowning. So I will stand in front of you face to face to command the storm in my life to cease. Um, and so the icon is a tool for prayer and it's a tool for us to understand that Christ in our own lives is this main subject. He is the one who will not be overcome by what he's surrounded by. He will overcome what's surrounding us. Um, which again w is very distinct from what you'll see in Catholic or Renaissance art, where you can't even tell where Christ is in this painting. Christ is right here. He is the man with the little glow. But it's difficult for us to stand in front of this icon and meditate on how Christ will overcome the storm for us. You know, the, the theological and spiritual concepts of this icon are blurred in this um, grasping for uh, painting things realistically or painting things dramatically. Um, and so there's a lot of like humanism that is going on in this painting as opposed to the structure in this icon that basically accommodates us for prayer. Light is probably one of the most important features of the icon. The icon is created through the use of light, and light um, controls the trajectory of the viewer's eyes to what is important in the same way hierarchy does in the last slide. And so light is this element um, that, that directs us to the presence of Christ in the icon. Sorry, and so you have in front of us here this detail from the icon of the transfiguration and you can see the disciples on Mount Tabor witnessing the light of Christ and you can witness how dramatically it illuminates them um, and the way that light functions in the icon you'll see is that the light source is always Christ. Christ is the light source for everything in the icon and if Christ is not present physically in the icon you will see that the light source is from the interior of the figure. Um, so the light source comes from inside and illuminates everything that is around them. And when you have multiple saints together, they illuminate each other and the light bounces off of each other. And so you'll have, if you, if any of you understand the way like that uh, light works in painting, you can see that the light bounces off of his neck here and the light bounces off of his neck here. Um, these two figures on the left. And it's sort of, they bounce off of each other. You know, the light reflects off of each other. So you have the light of Christ at the top, and then you have the light that's within them that bounces off of each other. And so light is this way of showing, like, the presence of the Holy Spirit and, and the presence of the light of Christ that illuminates from within the figure and from Christ himself. And that's why you'll see um, a gold leaf background sometimes in icons. That is the glory of Christ illuminating the icon. And so the light of Christ shines from behind the figure to you. And the icon is sort of like a lamp to you in your prayer. The gold, the reason we use gold, gold has no historical presence in the icon until the 18th or 19th century. But the reason that gold is used in the icon is when light shines onto the gold leaf, the gold reflects it as light. Um, which is why it is used especially in our church where we have a history of using candlelight to light our liturgies and sunlight through windows to, to light the building. Icons were, through that gold leaf, a source of light in the building. When the, when the light hits the gold leaf surface, it lights up whatever's around it. And so the icon is a source of light for us, standing in front of the icon, wanting to be a mirror of the icon, desiring to be, um, we ourselves, sources of light. 
Wind is another way um, that the Holy Spirit is, is depicted in the icon. So one way is light, the other way is wind. You will see sometimes, and this is also a pharaonic element, that clothes are flying behind a figure or their, their hair is flying or, or um, you know, that is, again, the movement of the Holy Spirit that stirs up whatever is happening in the icon. The background is very important. Um, again, there's the gold leaf background here that we discussed as a source of light. Um, another background that you will see in icons is this orange background right here. This comes from ancient Egypt and in ancient Egyptian religion, the sun god Ra used to cross over um, the sky in his sun boat. And Ra used to carry on his head the sun itself. And the sun used to light the sky as Ra crossed it. And so that to, to the ancient Egyptians was the concept of sunrise. With the introduction of Christianity, um, Ra was later replaced by Christ. And Christ brought to us the true light. Um, and he became the sunrise in, in Egyptian religion. So the sunrise in ancient Egyptian art was always reflected in the color orange. The color orange was always used to represent that. And so you'll see in a lot of icons that the color orange is used. Um, and that is a symbol of the sunrise. It is a symbol of the light of Christ again, which is basically another um, method of expressing what the gold leaf background does. So at the end of the day, the gold leaf background and the orange background express the same thing, which is the light of Christ. Um, shining through the icon, but one of them does it physically and another does it um, uh, in, in, in flat color, you know, without the use of um, gold leaf foil. Eyes are always depicted large um, as a symbol of spiritual vision and seeing um, Christ in, a, in everyone around us and in seeing things spiritually. The mouth is small. Um, as a symbol of the virtue of holy silence and quietness and again inviting the, the viewer to stand in front of the icon quietly in meditation um, and in some icons you'll see that some figures are depicted in profile these figures are evil figures and they turn away their heads from the viewer um, because they refuse to participate with the viewer in this prayer in this life of prayer um, and so whenever you see a figure whose head is turned sideways that figure is a figure who refuses to participate with Christ and his glory. Um, and so you'll see all the soldiers, all these high priests, um, Judas, uh, heretics, all these people in icons will be painted in profile. Whereas Christ and the saints are always depicted either in three quarter or full view because they are always in communion with us and we are always in communion with them. The landscape participates with the figures depicted um, again, to show the presence of the Holy Spirit in those figures. And so you'll see here in the crucifixion, the sky reacts to the crucifixion. Um, you'll see here in this fresco of the ascension, the trees and the sky react to the ascension of Christ. And so all of creation glorifies Christ and the saints by participating with them in the icon. And they will react to what they witness, and they almost in a way guide us to react as well. The halo um, also comes from ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian painting tradition, and you will see it um, in all forms of iconography uh, as a, a, a symbol of the light of Christ um, surrounding the saint. And Christ is the only figure who will have a cross in his halo. Um, no other figure will have that. But again, it is, it is an expression of that light that emanates from the saint from, from their holiness. You'll see within the hands of the saints um, symbols and sometimes in, in the background and in their clothing. And these are all tools that help us understand the life of the saint and what happened in their lives. And so Saint Demiana here is holding a cross um, as a declaration of her faith and a palm branch, which all the martyrs carry as they entered into the heavenly Jerusalem for their martyrdom. Um, and that's why you'll see that she wears blue as a symbol of her virginity, because virginity likens you to heaven. Um, and the borders of her clothing are red, and that is an allusion to her clothing being drenched in the blood of her martyrdom. 
Um, you have this icon of St. Basil here where he carries the censer and the gospel. Um, and those are allusions to his role as a clerical figure. You will have um, the peacock here and the flowers in the ground. In some icons, the number of flowers that are in the ground um, direct um, to the feast date in the church of what is depicted. And so in the icon of the Holy Family, the flight of the Holy Family to, um, to Egypt, I believe there are 24 flowers. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure when um, is the feast, but I know that the number of flowers is the feast date in, in the church. Um, and so you'll see this in a lot of other icons as well. Again, with scale, scale, this is what I was talking about earlier with um, Pharaoh defeating his enemies and conquering them and the size being indicative of their lack of significance and their lack of power. And you'll see even here on the left, an icon of Christ teaching in the temple. Christ is a child, but he is the same size as all of his, um, all of the elders that surround him in the temple. And it's just, it goes to show his significance and his importance. Symmetry goes back to the very first thing that we talked about, which was um, the, uh, the the calmness in the icon. Symmetry is a vehicle for that calmness um, that allows the icon, again, to be conducive for prayer. Clothing is used in the same way that symbolic elements are used to um, emphasize what the role of the saint was in their lives. So you have St. Anthony and St. Paul that are dressed in the garments they're described wearing um, in the Synexarium. And then you have St. Mina, who wears white for his purity and red for the bloodshed um, that led to his martyrdom. Um, and so color will be used in the clothing and in the elements surrounding the clothing um, as well. And so the Virgin Mary is dressed in brown as a color of humility. Um, and the humility covers the royalty of the red she wears underneath. Um, but she sits on a throne that is blue and covered with some stars you can see here as she is the second heaven and she is the dwelling place of God. She is his heaven. I will quickly go through history because history is a very, probably the most dense part of all of this. Um, so I will just give a brief um, overview. In the first few centuries of Christianity, um, we have a visual tradition that starts in the catacombs. And the catacombs are where we first start to see early symbols of Christianity and the very first paintings. And this is the first recorded image we have of Christ from the catacombs. Um, and the catacombs were where Christians held their worship for the most part and where they congregated. And so you can see um, that a lot of a lot of symbolism is used so that when these catacombs were discovered, they weren't immediately identified as hiding places for the Christians, and only the Christians understood most of what was being depicted um, in these catacombs. So it was very rare to have a depiction this explicit of Christ, for example. Usually Christ would be depicted as um, a youthful shepherd. Um, and you would have, this is where all these imagery, all the imagery of the fish and um, you know, uh, the, the, the crosses and all these things come up uh, in the catacombs. With the legalization of Christianity, you start to have more explicit imagery appear in churches and iconography becomes more extravagant and direct and symbolism becomes more of just, again, a, a, a vocabulary instead of the main form of art itself. And so this is the Feyum mummy portrait that I was referring to earlier. Um, and you can see the transition from pagan art to the frescoes in the cells of monks to the monastery of St. Anthony to the iconography that we have in the church today. And they retain largely the same features, this boldness, um, this, you know, direct eye contact, this uh, front facing, um, almost confrontational um, approach. And the icon is, is Christ almost commands the attention of the viewer. Um, and stylistically speaking, you have a lot of continuity. You know, you have a lot of the abstraction is maintained. Um, the color schemes are maintained. Structure is maintained. 
Um, and for the most part, abstraction is used. Uh, actually, we will speak about abstraction towards the end, but abstraction is used as a tool for um, not distracting the viewer in prayer. So going back to speaking about how ancient Egyptian art was used um, in, in the creation of this new art for Christians, you have in the very first image Isis, um, the ancient Egyptian goddess, breastfeeding her child Horus. And this image turns into the Virgin Mary breastfeeding her son Christ. You have in the first image here, Horus, the ancient Egyptian god, slaying um, Seth, or sometimes Apophis, who was this god of evil. Um, and so Horus takes his spear and slays him, and that will later turn into St. George slaying the dragon and spearing the dragon. Um, you have in ancient Egyptian art the sycamore tree as a symbol of life and a symbol of um, uh, uh, fertility and a symbol of, of new rebirth. Um, and in Coptic art, the sycamore tree will be translated into, again, a symbol of Christ himself and a symbol of paradise. And so um, that's why you will see in icons, again, one of three things, the gold leaf background, the orange background, or the sycamore tree or sycamore leaves, um, which allude, again, to paradise. And at the end of the day, all three things are synonymous in meaning. They are the light of Christ and they are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Ankh that is held by the pharaohs in their hands later turns into the cross. And in ancient Egyptian religion, the Ankh was, was called the key of life or the symbol of life. And to us, the key of life became the cross. Um, and so it was only fitting for the ancient Egyptians to take what was once the symbol of opening paradise as a key of life um, and bringing in the cross as the new symbol of what Christ used as the key of opening paradise for us. We even say in Tazbaha, um, he opened the gate um, of paradise and restored um, Adam once again to his authority. And so you have these things that, that use um, the pagan religion poetically and beautifully as, as, uh, an, uh, as a symbol of, of fulfillment and a symbol of completion. Um, not because this is a, a use that is spurred by inadequacy, um, but rather as, a, as, as something that shows Christ is the beginning and end of all things for us. Um, throughout the history of iconography, you have various people working in various ways. You have the Syrians who are painting in the 8th to 10th centuries. You have... Um, the Armenians who are working in Egypt from the 17th to 18th centuries. Um, and then once Egypt is colonized by the British and French and Turkish, you start to see a dwindling in iconographic artistic tradition. Um, because iconography, much like hymnology in the church, is transmitted through something called taslim. And taslim is basically oral tradition. Um, a master will sit down and will teach several disciples and the disciples will learn the tradition orally and will continue to transmit it that way because it is a very, um, it's, it's something that is based in handiwork and, and largely in artistic skill and talent. And so you'll see that with colonization in Egypt, these things died quite rapidly. And we even had a point in the church where there was such a lack of, um, artists, you had Europeans and Muslims painting icons for churches because they could not find available painters. And so in the 21st century, you have a man named um, Isaac Fanus. And Isaac Fanus was appointed by Pope Carlos VI to restore um, iconography in the church and to restore the iconographic tradition for use in the churches that were being opened up by Pope Carolus and later Pope Shenouda. And so Isaac Fanus traveled to Paris where he was trained in iconography and restoration. Um, and he came back and executed this huge campaign of research um, and, and, and study in order to develop the style that we see in our Coptic churches today, um, which are largely painted by his disciples. Some Coptic churches still have um, Western systems of painting, um, and 
those are remnants of, of the styles that existed before Fanus came into the picture. But Fanus largely re-established a pre-existing canon and tradition that we already had in our church today, um, which is why it's very important to learn and understand what this system that he re-established was. And so here I have on the right an icon by Fanus painted in the 90s. And on the left, I have the fresco that I showed you guys earlier. Um, from a cell in Bawit from the 6th century. So you can see the similarity between the 6th century and the 21st century and how Fanus brought back what existed already, but he did it in a vocabulary and a language that is contemporary and um, that speaks to the modern world and speaks to the modern Copt. Um, and again, you can see here, this is another beautiful icon by Fanus of, of the betrayal of Judas. Um, and you can see all sorts of influences. You see Cubism, you see ancient Egyptian art, you see Byzantine iconography, um, but most significantly, you see ancient Coptic art, and they come together harmoniously to build this icon that we see today. And throughout Fanus's process, there is a lot of deliberation and there is a lot of um, resolve that occurs within his icons to try and build the perfect icon. Um, and so you see, that's why you will see lots of changes in icons of the same thing painted by the same person as he tries to resolve what a Coptic icon should be, what a Coptic icon should look like. Um, and this is an example of his study and research throughout the years. And you can see the same thing here with the icon of St. Mark. Um, as for the technique of the icon, the icon starts with a board a wooden board that is covered in either gelatin, which is something that's used for cooking a lot, it's this very sticky substance, or rabbit skin glue. Either one is used as an adhesive to stick down a piece of cloth onto the piece of wood. And this adhesive is mixed with calcium carbonate to create this sort of chalky white primer. The board is covered in that primer, as you can see in step three. And then from there, um, the iconographer draws the design covers the board in the darkest colors for first, like in step four. And then from five, again, uses light to carve out the icon. He uses light to build, um, to bring the icon to life. And this process is known as illumination or enlightenment. Um, and for to make better sense of it, I've put together um, a time lapse where I scanned every brush stroke that I put down to show um, how the icon goes from point A to point B. So I will play that, hopefully it works. And so you can see that, again, we start with the darkest colors first, and then I add a layer of light, a layer of light, a layer of light, until the icon reaches completion. And the reason that the icon is painted this way is theological, or, you know, it has a spiritual interpretation to it, which is basically, just as we are icons of Christ, we are brought to life through the light of Christ. And so as Christ shines his light on us, we are brought to life and fruition. And so the icon is a mirroring of that. The icon is brought to life through this light of Christ, which is emulated through um, paint um, and paint being put down on wood and using tangible materials. Um, on the note of abstraction and why the iconographer and the church uses abstraction as the vocabulary for iconography, um, there is an iconographer in the UK named Aidan Hart who speaks beautifully on this subject. So I've put a couple quotes from him, um, and then I will show some examples. 
He says, one can say that abstraction makes icons more realistic than those naturalistic works which limit themselves to physical realities. For this reason, traditional liturgical art usually unites joy and sadness, hope and compunction. Sentimentality has no place. Its aim is to turn our will towards the will of God rather than to stimulate feelings. Um, and so you'll see in this example, a Coptic icon of Christ and a Renaissance painting of Christ. And Christ is almost, he, he's painted beautifully in terms of technical um, execution, but he is painted with, he's, he's in the dark, you know, um, and he is painted as this figure that is obscure. Um, and the, the, the focus of this painting is capturing his physical reality. Whereas the icon on the right will reduce for us what Christ looks like to a very basic image that is built by symbolism and symbolism only. And so instead of the artist painting what Christ should look like in our minds for us and putting a very specific image in our minds of what Christ looks like, we build an image of Christ for ourselves based off of symbolism and not physical um, looks. And so a lot of little details are excluded from this abstracted image. And basically what is the very elaborate image on the left is watered down um, visually to the image on the right that presents to us the very minimal information that we need to know and information that is built from symbolic language. He also says, at the risk of overgeneralizing the differences, Orthodox iconography aims to inst indicate a transfigured world and freely uses abstract means to suggest divine realities. It flattens in order to evoke rather than imitate and to lead through to the subject matter rather than to reproduce it pictorially. As we shall see, the icon teaches us as much through the way it depicts things as in what it depicts. The icon is a radical way of seeing and therefore suggests a radical way of acting. When we look at an icon, we are seeing how a saint sees. In short, the saint sees things as they are. And so again, another example is two paintings of the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, you have one on the left from the Renaissance and one on the right from Cairo painted by, by Isaac Fenus. And you can see how the one on the left is very theatrical. It's very exciting. It's, it's, it builds a narrative for us on the grounds of movement and, and excitement. And this is happening and that's happening. And um, at the same time, the problem with this painting is that it's very sensual and it's very um, focused on physical realities. Um, what does Isaac's body look like? What does um, Abraham's clothing look like? What is he dressed in? What is the lighting in this piece like? What is this beautiful scenery that they sit in? Whereas if you see the icon on the right, we are presented with just enough information to know what's happening. And the rest is up to us to meditate and complete the story. Um, and so you have the ram in the thicket in the bottom left corner, and that is the only information we are giving, given in terms of the background. And then you have the angel who comes in and he stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac and he saves Isaac. And, and so we use the symbolism that these things are built with to build the rest of what we should meditate on. Whereas the painting on the left gives us this information and it doesn't really leave enough room for us to come to our own spiritual conclusions. In sense, liturgical art is not art in its modern sense. Its aim is to lead us beyond itself and not to be admired as a standalone work of art. This requires a deliberate imperfection in the work to remind us that the ultimate reality is the subject matter and not the image. This in large part explains why the Orthodox icon tradition tends to compress three-dimensional space into two and use other means to abstraction. Abstraction is in fact common to sacred art of virtually all cultures. Naturalism emerges in anthropocentric epochs. And so again, I have a comparison of two churches. One is in Cairo, painted by Fanous, and one is in Sharm el-Sheikh, um, painted much more recently. And both are incredibly beautiful, um, but both use 
very different systems of, of iconography for very different purposes. As a liturgical um, instrument and a liturgical device, whereas um, the one on the left uses art theatrically the, as a theatrical instrument, almost to make the church um, a space within which one can observe and only observe. Um, it doesn't really leave a lot of room for participation. Um, and we continue to see this in other examples of, of Western art versus iconography. Um, these are two images that might be very familiar to a lot of cops. It'll be, you know, you see it in a lot of um, churches, a lot of homes, and a lot of calendars, publications. It's something that comes up a lot. And it shows Christ um, with the crown of thorns or Christ um, in his suffering. And the emphasis of these paintings is the pain of Christ. The emphasis of the paintings is the suffering of Christ, the blood and the pain and the gore. Um, and the, for us, it allows us to meditate on the pain of Christ, but it stops there because it doesn't allow us to see anything else. Um, the image that is put before us, that is presented to us, doesn't give room for much more. Whereas if you look at a Coptic icon of Christ on the cross, you will see that he is serene and silent. Um, and this is very important to the ideas that are expressed in the hymnology of the church on Good Friday. The cross of Christ becomes his throne. And from his throne, Christ shows us his triumph and his victory and his power. And that is why in the 12th hour of Good Friday, we sing Pekethronos, which is the psalm um, in which David says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And so you have an image of pain and suffering and it ends there. And you have an icon that has blood and has the crown of thorns and has the suffering of Christ. But it also gives us room to meditate on the resolve of Christ and his, his, um, the peace that he carries with him in dying because he loves us and dying out of his will for us, um, out, of, you know, out of his pure sacrificial love. Um, and so that's why both depict, in theory, the same biblical narrative, but they depict them in very different ways to evoke very different responses from the viewer. Um, and that is the difference between regular painting um, and an icon used in the church as a part of the church's activities and as a part of the church's life. Um, this final slide here um, is, is just something that I wanted to show as an example of how icons of very different narratives can tie together to express the exact same thing. So on the far left, you have the three holy youth in the fiery furnace with the angel um, who is described as the son of God descending into the flames to save them. And then in the central icon, you have the Anastasis, which is Christ descending into Hades to pull out Adam and Eve um, and all the righteous from death. And on the far right, you have the Theophany of Christ, um, his baptism in the, in the River Jordan um, at the hand of John the Baptist. In all three icons, Christ descends into something to pull us out with him. Christ descends into the fiery furnace to pull us out to praise and glorify him. Christ descends into Hades to pull us out from the death um, that kept us in our tombs and Christ descends into the waters of the Jordan to bring us up with him in celebrating rebirth and new life. The way these icons are designed and composed is meant for the three to mirror each other. Christ is the central figure. Christ is the largest figure and Christ is engulfed in light in all three or a ray of light. And Christ is what we face and we participate with the three youth, we participate with Adam and Eve, and we participate with the angels and being raised with Christ in his glory. And his glory is suggested in different ways, and each three depict different points in the Bible, but each of the three have the same storyline, have the same narrative, and that is expressed in how these icons are painted.
And we are given the room to interpret this this way because of the iconographic style in which the icon is presented to us. Um, and so this was just my, my final example um, for, for what the icon accomplishes quite poetically. Um, and that's that's everything I had for today. I don't know if you guys had questions or, or what now, but um, I, I hope this was uh, a meaningful discussion and it, it'll, it'll help people understand a little bit better um, why icons are painted the way that they are um, and why they exist the way that they do in, in churches today. Thank you, George. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful talk, uh, very enlightening. Uh, we're very blessed. Uh, that you could uh, share that with us. Uh, just waiting to see if anybody has any other questions uh, for uh, George while we have him with us. Um, tell us actually a little bit about yourself. Maybe tell us about your uh, your website just so that uh, people can uh, see some more of your work and uh, understand where you're coming from. Sorry about the background noise. The kids wanted to watch the talk too, and so I could not deny them that. And uh, so that's what you're hearing in the background. No worries. Uh, for my website, I think if you scan this QR code, uh, it should take you to my website. A little bit about myself. Um, I study fine arts uh, in university, um, but I don't actually do any iconography for university. It's all something on the side. Um, I was trained in iconography 10 years ago by a, a student of, of um, Isaac Fanus. Her name is Sehem. Um, and throughout those 10 years, I've encountered other iconographers as well and worked with them, um, which has kind of built my understanding of iconography as it stands now. Um, but I am by no means uh, an experienced iconographer. I still have a long way to go and a lot to learn. Um, but I, I currently do paint icons now for, for churches and for private collections. Um, and I hope to research this a lot more, um, systematically in the future, but yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. Well, thank you very much. Um, Again, uh, if anybody wants to see more of uh, George's work, it, please scan this QR uh, code. Uh, why don't we conclude this uh, with uh, just saying our Father. So, uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The Lord, please hear us as we cry unto you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you again, George. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Patrick, you're going to end the meeting? Ernest.
see, Bubba. Do you want to see here? Now you're on the internet. All right, I will see you. I'll talk. Do you, to you. Does 